So we're, we're coming towards the end, so please let me know if there are some topics you would like covered in further depth. Um, I think I've covered almost all of the main things that I promised, but maybe you want a little more detail, so let me know. And um, if you don't tell me, then I may talk about some special topics, such as polymorphism and phase transitions, which are interesting to crystallographers, but not necessarily to you. So um, yeah, so just let me know. And today I want to give you some tips about this important step, which is creating the graphics for your publications. Um, this is, I, I actually always enjoyed art very much, so I really do enjoy doing the graphics, but you can spend a lot of time on it, I admit. Uh, but I, I really think that helps get things published as well, so it's worth spending the time on it. Um, and and as, as Sankar said, you know, analysis of the structure, maybe not too much analysis unless it's just for a crystallographic journal, but enough to interest the general reader is really useful too. I, I review so many papers where the, the crystallography is sloppy, the diagrams are impossible to see, they're too small, they're trying to squeeze too much into a small space. They haven't actually labeled the atoms, all they've done is color them, but sometimes there's red and there's orange and you can't really tell the difference. <laughs> um, so, you know, think about what is appealing to you, what will be appealing to the reader, and be Clarity is the key, clarity. The colors must be clear, the lettering must be clear, the projection that you take must be clear, you don't want too much overlapping, that kind of thing. So, yeah, be, be uh, patient and do a good job. So, um, I realize that everyone's using different programs, so, <laughs> you know, once again, I'm not gonna talk about all the different ones. I really do like, uh, the output that Olex2 does, even though I don't like Olex2 very much. Shellex La, which is a pretty new program, is pretty good too. Um, but you use what you feel comfortable with, and hopefully you can get what you want without too much trouble. So I will show you uh, a little bit about XP, because I've been using it so long, and I do think it does a pretty good job, actually, especially just for the, the standard thermal ellipsoid plot it's, it's very good. So here's the uh, kind of the key to using XP. You start out with a good projection. We've done a little bit of that already where you say proj and you see the molecule. Sometimes you, s you create a least squares plane and project down the plane that spreads it all out. Then if you're preparing to do a graphic, uh, one of the things you want to define is a tip, a t y p. So this use, uses the, uh, the usual keywords where you can select, if you just say A tip minus two and nothing else, that is going to apply to all the atoms in the structure and it will generate this kind of uh, thermal ellipsoid, the kind where it's just open and then there's the principal axes are shown. There's another kind that's more shaded, but I find that that gets pretty cluttered looking and I don't like it as well you know, where it's like this, I don't remember exactly, something like this. It looks dark. I like the open one better. So this is a A tip minus two, but the other one is available also. But that's gonna to apply to all the atoms, and you don't want the hydrogen atoms to be anisotropic. So usually I just say A tip two for hydrogens. But that would like be a second command because the second command overrides the first command. So you just say dollar sign H. So make, the, make all of the hydrogen atoms a circle. The, the program has many other options. You can do crosshatched like this. You can do some shading on the circle. Um, you can do nothing. <laughs> Don't even draw, a if you just want lines, you don't have to have something there. So you have to actually go to, I'm not, I didn't list all of the options. You go to the help menu, say help, a tip, and it lists all the possibilities. Um, ARAD controls the size if it's isotropic. If it's anisotropic, uh, when you go to do the drawing, you tell it what percent probability thermal ellipsoid you want. 
most of the time 50% probability. But for a circle, you have, uh, you can adjust the size and uh, I'll tell you a little more about that in a sec. Then you create a plot file using the TELP command and I'll, I'll give you the arguments in a sec. I'm just giving you kind of the overview first. Um, yes, before you do TELP, <laughs> you should say label because label is going to control whether or not you have parentheses like C parentheses one or just C one. Um, and whether or not you do hydrogen labels and so on. So you should say that before you do tell. And then as, as you create the, the diagram, you can either just, you can exit at some point with a B command, or you can just go to the end and then it will save it as well. Then, okay, that's actually going to be a binary file that you create. So you need to use another command, namely draw, to output something else. And it, it's a little old fashioned. I'll, I'll show you in a sec. So lastly, though, you're going to make a postscript file and you need to convert the postscript file to something, usually something that's more common, like JPEG or TIFF. So we'll go through all of that. So coming back to the label command, um, the code is how you want it. There's just four possibilities, with brackets, without brackets, uh, with hydrogen and without hydrogen, and four, four options there, four permutations. Um, code one is no brackets and no hydrogens being labeled, which is kind of the most common one. And then size, it's hard to predict actually, but the default is 600 for size. Uh, I rarely ever use 600, but maybe 500 or 525, something in that range. You have to kind of play around with it. And anyway, if the label size isn't satisfactory, you can usually edit it later. So um, a tip, again, has all these possibilities, thermal ellipsoids, open circles, and shaded circles, and so on. So you have to, if you say help a tip, it lists all the possibilities. Um, keywords applies to all of the commands. So like this is a keyword, dollar sign H. If you leave off keywords, it's everything. Uh, if you want to confine it, confine it to just two atoms, you just name those atoms by name. If you want it to be a list, you could say a list uh, like C1 to C10. And there's an option there too, I didn't tell you this. So if you want the whole list, you can write C1 to C10, but you can also write C1 greater than C10. They both work. But there's a space here in each case. So you can say help keywords, and it, it explains all that, too. I don't want to go into too much detail, because I don't know whether any of you will actually use XP. <laughs> I'm promoting it anyway. Um, so for hydrogen, I usually use uh, an ARAD of 0.11, because I don't want them to look bigger than the other atoms. And th that generally will make them smaller. Again, you can just set whatever you want. All right, now the actual uh, graphic creating command is TELP. It stands for thermal ellipsoid plot, of course. And it has some arguments here. Uh, S is for stereo, which you never see anymore, but people used to do drawings in stereo where the left hand uh, drawing is rotated so many degrees, the right hand so many degrees. Then you, if you can cross your eyes, you can see it in three dimensions, or you can use the special glasses and see it in three dimensions. And if the older publications of crystal structures often have these drawings side by side. And they, they really do jump out at you. They look very good. Um, but the journals don't want them anymore, so <laughs> forget about that. <laughs> um, so usually zero, because you're not using stereo. Then P is the percentage probability that's being displayed for the thermal ellipsoids, usually 50%. Unless, of course, they're absolutely small, because you have a lot of heavy atoms, say, then you might want to ramp it up. Um, if you have really large thermal ellipsoids, you might want to ramp it down. I wouldn't go below about 30%, though. Uh, B is the thickness of the bond that's being drawn. 
so a good value is 0.03, unless you want it thicker. Um, actually, I didn't put on here, but you can also control whether the bond is an open one or a filled one, or a dashed or a dot. There's a whole lot of different choices. Um, okay, let's see. Then the orthographic projection, do you guys know what that is? It's where everything's flattened out. It's as if you're seeing it from really far away. Okay. As you get closer to an object, you start to see depth. Uh, like an inorganic molecule, you start to see these imaginary atoms coming out toward you, you know, with a wedge, or away from you with the wedge in the oppo opposite direction. So I like the orthographic, actually. I think it looks good because it's, um, well, it just doesn't distort it as much. However, you can, for D, you can come in closer if you want to. You could try, um, say, a value of 30 or something like that. And it might look good to you. If you were especially trying to emphasize a chiral molecule, you want to see what's coming out, what's coming away. OK, lastly, if you want the outline of the unit cell to show up, you type for, uh, the, after the keywords, or if there is no keywords, you just type cell, and it will draw an outline of the cell. Now, if your molecule doesn't actually fall within the cell between 0 and 1, 0 and 1, 0 and 1, it, it's not going to look like it's in it either, so think about that. I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you a real quick run through of this. So the labels are going to appear, and each time it's ready for uh, you to position the label, it'll, it'll be uh, flashing. So you can then move it with your mouse to where you think it looks good in the molecule or next to the atom. You don't want it on top of the atom, so you're going to move it to the side a little bit. And if you don't like what you did, you can go back. You can just do backspace. And if you don't want any label at all, just type N for next, and it goes to the next label. Again, you know, type B when you're finished, or just go all the way to the end, to the last label, and it'll end. OK, so now it'll ask you for a file name. <coughs> and the default suffix for that, the file extension, is PLT. But you can give it whatever you want. But just keep in mind that the only way you can see that file again, now, now that you've done it this way, is by going back into XP. And you can say view, and then give that file name. But I don't think there's any other program that can read these file names at this point. So uh, keep track of what you called it if you think you want to come back to it. It's OK. It's not possible to re-edit it either. You have to start over again. So there's that disadvantage. But now you can make it into a different kind of uh, file type. This program is so old that it actually requests some file types that don't even exist anymore. Um, but you can make it a PostScript file. I'll show you that. And PostScript, you can then convert to something else pretty easily. Um, you also have to decide at that time whether you want color or black and white. <coughs> Although you could, of course, say color and then change all the colors to black and white. Older journals didn't print color, and they discouraged color unless it was going to be online. Nowadays, they say, please use color. <laughs> so we've changed. The colors that come out of this program need to be enhanced, generally. Some of them look fine, like blue and red looks fine, but uh, some of the other colors are faint. So what I usually do is use Adobe Illustrator, but there are other programs that you can use to modify the colors and enhance them. All right. Um, so yeah, you can convert PostScript to EPS, Enhanced PostScript. But I think it's better to just try to make it into a JPEG or a TIFF. <coughs> the journals have different requirements, but most of them have this requirement. Um, if it's just a line art, like a chem draw or something like that, <coughs> they request that the graphic have 1,200 DPI, dots per inch. If it's grayscale, 600 DPI, and if it's color, 300 DPI minimum. You can look at the notes for authors, though, and see what they recommend. Um, 
Yeah, the other thing I, I strongly recommend is that if, if you think you're going to be publishing in it and it's going to be in a single column width, that you actually shrink it using some software to that size, which is 8.9 centimeters or 3.5 inches. Look at it and see if it seems clear. And you can actually, if you use um, <coughs> that size and it's still got the high resolution, and maybe you've used a compression feature, you're fine with that. The other thing that journals don't like is if you send in a graphic that's like 10 megabytes or something like that. They would rather you compress it. <laughs> that's, of course, less of a consideration these days because everybody has more storage. Then this is just, this is the structure we were working on the other day that we solved with tin. And I'm showing you what it looks like in both black and white and in color. So probably I'd do it in color nowadays. But the black and white still shows up really well. You know, it's, it's very dark black. And um, the lower one, so the tin's kind of light. I might make that darker. And the green places where the oxygens, where the hydrogens are, it's kind of light too. I might make that darker. But the red and the blue looks good. And I do prefer the labels without parentheses myself. I think most people like that better. Uh, one other point is don't label every atom if it's kind of obvious what that atom is. So like in this case, when I, once I got to the ring here, I think it was sort of obvious that it was going to continue like that. You know, it went C1, C2, C3. And then it's going to go four, five, six, seven. I don't need to put all those on there. People could figure that out, right? Same thing on this side. So usually, like on a phenyl ring or a benzene ring, I'll just label the first two carbons and hope that the, anybody who really cares will see that you're going around sequentially. Uh, I did use a, a type of a command that's called either link or join to describe kind of a fat dashed line to show the hydrogen bonding. But again, you have a choice. You could use open dashed lines, or you could use thinner dashed lines, or you could use dots, or nothing. Uh, it's up to you. Use your artistic sense. Draw what looks good. I think this is kind of cool, the way this hydrogen bonding ended up in this. I like it. So I did want to include it in the figure. And this orientation works out pretty well in showing all the atoms without any overlap. There are, of course, structures where it's impossible to get a good view without any overlap. But just, you just have to do what you can. Or maybe take, publish two views, maybe, depending. OK, so the, I think the labels are often left off, but they're really useful. I don't like seeing di a diagram where everything is just color-coded. You know, all the nitrogens are blue, it says, and everything. I like to see some of the labels, because if you want to look at their table of bond distances and angles, in the table, it gives labels. So you need to have the corresponding figure so you can look at it and see what they're talking about. So a few labels are useful. Oh, this is just another example. This was a a paper that was just accepted, actually, in Inorganica Chemica Acta. And we did a, a lot of uh, co-crystallizations with this dithiolene, hoping that there would be some kind of charge transfer to a fullerene, which has been predicted for a long time. And in the process, we also got a structure just of the dithiolene by itself, which had a very interesting kind of uh, shift stacking arrangement in the structure. So. There's a, a drawing that I did with XP, but I did edit it with Adobe Illustrator. So I could put in um, these, these distances here. That's one reason why I really like Adobe Illustrator. You can, you can also rotate them easily, move them on top of a bond and stuff. OK, so that's just another example. We didn't see charge transfer. <laughs> Some people have have uh, published things about this molecule where there is charge transfer. It's kind of one of those non-innocent ligand situations. But nothing here. Didn't, didn't do it. 
not with the fullerenes anyway. Oh, here's another picture. So this picture was actually done with mercury, which I know a lot of you use. And it, it shows uh, something that looks like a porphyrins, the way that they, they stack back to back, these nickel diphthylenes. And then there's toluene in the structure. Uh, two different kinds of C70s in this case. The blue ones represent one rhodomer and the red one's a different one. But it's all an ordered structure. That was very nice. No disorder in this structure. So using mercury, you can do some really jazzy things if you want to take the time to do it. Uh, this is one I did just showing the um, displacements from the least squares plane of the central part of the nickel diphthylene. And then I used a gradient color for the background and added a lot more information and did a little bit of depth cueing to show how these rings were tilted. Anyway, I think that ended up in the supporting information, but I had fun making that picture. I thought it was pretty. So you can do a lot with mercury if you take the time to figure out all the the things that they have there. So this was also done with mercury. And um, this is, again, a co-crystallization. We do a lot of those with hexabromobenzene, uh, which formed this really kind of curved packing thing. It looked like a wave in there. The reason that it it occurs like that as you get halogen-halogen interactions in addition to fullerene-halogen interactions. So the halogen-halogen interactions cause them to kind of come like this so that the halogens can come close together. And then the end result is a wave that uh, is following the curvature of the, it's compatible with the curvature of the porphyrins themselves. So I thought that was pretty cool. So let's look a little, little bit more at the mercury graphics. There's, there's a new version of mercury that just came out, which is the 2018 version. And I don't even have it yet. So I hope I'm not telling you something that's obsolete. But um, the input files can be many different types in mercury. You can start with the SIF, or you can start with a res. Or like if you do calculations, you might want to use a mole file if you do uh, macromolecular stuff, you might start with a PDB file. So it, it accepts many file types. The recent versions allow you to do a lot of things by just right clicking in the main window. I'm so glad they changed that because it used to be really hard to find what you wanted in the menu at the top. So these things all appear at the top as well. But if you just right click in the main window, it's much easier. And moving the labels is much easier. Changing the style of the labels is much easier. Um, covalent radii is still a little bit hard to change, but you could do that too. It tends to just divide everything into metals or non-metals, which isn't enough sometimes. OK, I'll just show you a couple more things, and then I'll, I'll actually get out of here, and we'll do it live, if that's OK with you. So in this version of Mercury, they had introduced a way of creating uh, a movie, except it wasn't complete because, OK, you could create the images for the movie by just doing uh, sequential rotations of your structure and saving those files as JPEGs. But they never had any way of stitching those images together to make the movie, which is quite irritating. Um, but there are programs out there to do that. It's just finding one that's simple. Some of them do it, but they're so complicated. I found one that's super simple. It's, um, OK, let me show you a movie first, and I'll tell you the program. So if you look up the, uh, in the help menu about making a movie, it's about a page long. It's not too horrible, but you have to convert your graphic to a Pavre graphic to do it because they're using the algorithm that's in the Pavre program to do the rendering. Uh, Pavre also does the same thing. Have any of you ever used Pavre? It, it's, it does beautiful, beautiful graphics, but it's, it's like ancient uh, interface. So it's, again, a little bit like a SIF. You have to learn 
line by line how it controls itself. I'll show you a couple. Okay, so this one is just you know the quick and dirty movie, and um, it really it, you know it, it displays very well that this molecule is quite planar. It actually has borons in it. Those light colored colored atoms in there are oops are borons. Anyway, then you can also, this, this really takes almost no time at all. It's so easy to do in Mercury if you have this auxiliary program. But I'm not going to show you that today because something happened with my, my version of Mercury. I'm not sure what. So this is a packing diagram of the same structure. Also, I mean, it's, it's really elegant, I think, and it really didn't take much time. So the third-party software that you need to convert these files to a movie that I've been using is this one right here. So I'm, again, I'll give you this PowerPoint so you'll have this. You can look it up. It's a Czechoslovakian site. Um, I hope you pro your computer doesn't say that it's, it's uh, blocked in some way. But it's fine. It's, I, I guarantee you it's OK. Now, PAVRE stands for Persistence of Vision Ray Tracing. I attempted to master it some years ago, and I can still do it. But sometimes I have to look things up. This is the website for Pavre. But it does make spectacular pictures. Very, very nice if you want to do really nice uh, TOCs, table of contents pictures, or even covers for journals. If you make a pretty picture, the journals will often accept your, your work as a cover. And then mom and dad love to see that. <laughs> so <laughs> I recommend making pretty drawings for journal covers. You know, you, you can just offer to do one, and, they'll, and it, if you submit a picture, they like it, they'll use it. OK, so this was, I thought I had a poverty picture in there. Where is it? Maybe it's, I hope it's still there. This is another movie. Um, it was done with the program Crystal Maker. Have any of you ever used Crystal Maker? Uh, yeah, so materials, people often use Crystal Maker, but it also can do movies. And this is a, a fullerene. And it, it sort of does a little bit of this uh, ray tracing thing where there, it looks like there's a highlight coming. It enhances the appearance of the atoms, which I like. OK, here's the perfect picture. I put it out of order. Um, you can see the shadows. You see depth cueing. Um, it gives it very good dimensionality. It's, it's very brilliant. You can also adjust the colors as much as you want using either RGB or CMYK. And um, you can change the direction the lights come in. You can do just about anything you want. <coughs> so I've only had this one <coughs> with me, but um, I have used them in the past, and I think they look really good. OK, let me now show you some live stuff. Cobalt structure with um, the blue or light blue or nitrogen, the red or oxygen. The rest is obvious, I think. Dark blue is cobalt. However, um, this is not the asymmetric unit. If you want to see the asymmetric unit, you can actually just click on this box. And that's the asymmetric unit. <laughs> so if you click it again, it goes back. So it automatically puts together a full molecule for you. Sometimes you don't even want that. So there's another reason to use a stupid or older program like XP, because it doesn't do that. <laughs> this has a very, very strong intramolecular hydrogen bond see this here it's, it's like linear there's also some external hydrogen bonding but I just wanted to show you like how you might display this so is anybody here not at all familiar with mercury have, and do you have the, the full version or you have the free version do you have the one that comes with CSD yeah. no all right 
Some people don't. So you can shift it around here, you can expand it, contract it, and so on. Rotate. Now, to make this into a graphic for publication, you want to be able to show thermal ellipsoids, and you want to be able to put labels on it. Now, since the journals are accepting color most of the time now, this would be a reasonable approach to use Mercury. They have greatly improved the ability to make these graphics. There are many more options. They're much easier to find <laughs> than they were before. <laughs> So everything is actually up here in this top menu, but now you can actually right click and get almost everything you need down here. So if you go to style, so I'm just right clicking to get to styles. I can, well I can do any, any style I want, wireframe, looks just like that. Um, capped sticks, doesn't look like anything. <laughs> Ball and stick is the default that came up. Space fill, if you like space fill. <laughs> so these are all just under styles. Um, then you come down here to ellipsoid. And uh, I'm sure they're assuming that this is what you're going to be doing for a publication because it puts in 50% ellipsoids already. They look a little small to me, but I guess they are 50%. And the hydrogens are just, just uh, balls, no, not ellipsoids. Then in that same menu, you can go to ellipsoid settings. And you can change the probability level. You know, like for example, make it 80%. You see they get bigger. But let's keep it at 50% anyway. Um, you can draw the axes in color. So they're in black there, kind of like that. But you can change the color, too. Just click on that box. Um, draw hydrogens as fixed side spheres of radius such and such. I mean, hmm, I might make them a tiny bit smaller, but they're, they're pretty good like that. Draw non-positive definite atoms as cubes. Wow. XP doesn't allow you to draw non-positive definite atoms. so. That might be useful, but don't publish that. <laughs> Bond style stick, but you also have other, you can do wireframe too, like that. But that would be too faint for publication. But you can change the radius, of course. So you can make it bigger, smaller, whatever you like. So this is pretty convenient, just having everything right here on the window. And then you can go to the um, labels and show labels, hide labels, label color, label size. So if I just show labels, it puts them all on top of uh, the atom. So you don't want to leave it like that. You want them to be shifted off the atom just a little bit so you can still see what they belong to, but not right on top. So you can go again to labels. Let's just hide labels first of all. No, I don't want to hide all the labels, sorry. Show labels. There's another one. Picking mode. Picking mode is um, toggle labels. So if I don't want to label the hydrogens, I can just go like this. Maybe leave that one there, because that's cool. If I follow what I said to you before, I wouldn't really need to label uh, three, four, and five here. But now I want to move the labels. So how do I do that? Um, not there. Picking mode. Move labels. Then you just drag them. Where you think they look good. And 
I think what happens if you, if you wait too long to do this, then you have to just click on that again. Anyhow, you get the idea. So I've moved them. Maybe I want a different font. I want to make them italic, um, a different color. You have all those options. You can do that. You might not even, <clears throat> it's, it's sort of strange because usually you would say these are primes <clears throat> on, the, on one side and not primed on the other side to indicate that there is symmetry. So you might want to actually edit them so that it gives you the primes if you're using this method. The cobalt is not good, definitely. OK, so that looks, something like that would be OK for publication, I think. Unless you want to make the labels bigger, you can do all of that again down here. You can do. Um, Oh, it's under, it's under styles. Label size, I guess. But there's another one where you can change the font, which was always hard to find before, and it's still hard to find. <laughs> oh, maybe you have to come up here. Let's see. Did I say? Anyway, you can change the font. I guarantee you, you can. So let's see what you would do if you wanted to. So to make, to make the movie, you have to go up here. I'm not going to do it because it crashes for some reason, but go to Poveray Image. And it allows you to do things like set the resolution, um, file format, color, rotate around x, y, or z how many uh, images you want to render, the number of frames, for example. So the default is 30, and that usually turns out pretty well. So you have all, all these things you can play with. But then very important, set the output directory, because you may not realize where they ended up on your computer. So you know, set a, a directory that you call movie files or something like that, and make sure they end up there. Then. You can save as. You can save as a Poveray image. Unfortunately, the Poveray image that's generated um, in this program does not allow you to do any depth queuing. So I usually don't use Poveray here. But you can also pick. Uh, and if you want to save where you're at and you don't want to worry about coming back to it, you should save it as a uh, Mercury file. Oh, OK, sorry. Save it as a Mercury compressed file, an MRYX file. That way, if you exit the program, you can come back in to where you left off. But you have these other options, too. You can use ping. You can use TIFF. Ping are smaller files than TIFF because they're automatically compressed. But if you use an, another program, you can compress TIFF files. Uh, Adobe Photoshop does a good job. Adobe Illustrator does a good job. They both use this LZ, uh, it called? LZJ compression. Anyway, it asks you if you want to do it. Say yes. I'll show you that. OK, got that? You can do many, many things with Mercury. There's help up here, tutorials, and also just a main manual. And the new version is just about to come out, so who knows what they're doing now. They change it every year, every year. It's, it gets better and better. Uh, it's, 
like it's a little bit hairy if you just ask it to pack it'll leave uh, molecules with hanging parts but you can get rid of the hanging parts that kind of thing you could show cell axes and so on many things you can do depth queuing this is just one setting for the depth queuing but you can actually depth queue in a whole range so this is probably too much depth queuing it just made everything look faint Z clipping and so on okay what about XP now let's see if we can do this So here's another molecule that's not too terribly big. There's a cyclopentadiene ring. Well, you can see what it is. Here's the atom labels. So there's arenium, uh, an NO group, there's a phosphine, a little bit of everything in this one. So probably for doing this for publication, I might take off the hydrogens because it starts to get pretty cluttered. So I can just say kill dollar sign H. And I would probably use my 3D glasses, but you don't need to. <laughs> Maybe you like the phosphine and the rhenium to be a, a, on a horizontal line with respect to each other. There is a way to do that. <clears throat> Wait, I need to know their names. P1 and RE1. So if you just say rota, P1, RE1, and proj again, they're on a line. I, I kind of like that. And you can also just rotate it around all the way by the same kind of method. So it's X and Y and, and Z is coming out toward you. So I want to rotate around Y, which is considered to be two if I do it by 180, it's going to turn it around. Should have. Didn't. What did I do wrong? Oh. Is this X? Yes, that was X. <laughs> OK. You could also um, not show the bonds to the cyclopenadiene. Uh, that gets it a little bit cluttered. Or you could put the, those lines in as dashed lines. And then it won't look so cluttered. So here's, if you say help, join, these are the different kinds of bonds that you can draw. Solid, open, dash solid, dashed open, full line, dashes, or dots, depending on what the output is. Um, I might try for dashes. So that's going to be either type 6 or type 7. I'm not sure which. Six. Let's see what happens with 6. So for example, I can just say um, join 6 RE1 and proj. And it makes all of its bonds dashed, or dot, yeah, dashed. <laughs> That's easier than naming them all one by one. But now I can just do <clears throat> a solid line between rhenium and P1, and a solid line between rhenium and nitrogen, and between rhenium and C6. So again, I can say join one, rhenium one, P1, join one, rhenium one, P6. And what's that nitrogen called? N1, OK. Something's still not right. Hmm. I mistyped it. Oh, I said P6. I did read mistype it. OK. Now it looks pretty good, except maybe this, this phenyl ring, you want to rotate just a little more. One way or the other. No, back. And maybe down a little bit. Yeah, it's 
so you know now you can kind of see <coughs> everything. Go back here. Okay. <coughs> now. I want the non-hydrogen atoms to all be anisotropic, so I'll say A2 minus 2. I want the labels to be just kind of normal labels with no parentheses, so I say label 1, say 560, something like that. If those are too big, then I can, <coughs> I can always make them smaller. That's about it. So then tell 050.03. And that's all I'm going to say because I'm going to, well, I'll say zero. So it's orthographic projection. And now I give it a plot file name. So I, whatever, I call it rename one. And <clears throat> it, it's, it's pretty nicely drawn, I think. This little box is the atom label, and it starts out next to the atom that's going to be labeled next. So I'm going to move it to a place where it looks like it would have a lot of space. So maybe here. And then I'll go around sulfur, phosphorus, nitrogen, oxygen. Um, this. Might label all these because you never know. You can always change your mind about that later, too, of course. Here, I don't think I need to do all of them. Just a couple. And then I'll go next, 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 to the next ring. Maybe that's enough. Anyway. I think I'm done, so I'm just going to say B. And if I want to see that again, I can say view RE1. So there it is. But again, this is binary, so you could take a picture of it, but you can't actually do anything else with it. Uh, there's another option here for displaying. It's called PERS, which draws uh, kind of a cool looking picture too. But again, it's binary, so you can't. All you could do is do a screen save of it or something like that. OK, so if I want to now make a, a TIFF, I have to say draw. RE1, and it'll, it'll automatically take the PLT extension. And if you have it set up so that this is connected to a printer, you can actually just directly print, but I don't have it set up to a printer. So I'm going to select option uh, A, which, is, which will make an Adobe PostScript file. When this program was written, we, people used HPGL files to draw in printers. That was a long time ago. Pen plotters. We don't use those anymore. <laughs> and I'm going to call this file um, RE1, say underline one, just, just so I can keep track of it. And here you I have the option of color or black and white. So just for fun, I'll say color. And wait a minute while it makes this file. OK. Uh, nothing further to do in XP, so after I need to exit here and go into some other program with this. But there should be a PostScript file right here in this directory with just the file extension PS. Yeah, that's the one I just made. So I'm going to show you Adobe Illustrator just because I like it. But there are some freeware programs that will do this as well. Not maybe as well, but they will do it. Our bookstore had a really good deal where you could get Adobe Illustrator, Adobe Acrobat, and Adobe Photoshop all, all together for like $99, which is a bargain, actually. So I have all of those. <laughs> They're good. They're really good. Okay, so here we go. Open. And I need 
need to find that file. I could use quick access, I guess. And it is here. Okay, so that's the one I made. So you see the disadvantage nowadays is that in this program, if you make something black, which is the carbons and the labels, they're too light, they're too gray. So I want to make those all black. But I also want to rotate it so I can see it better. So you can just select all and go object, transform, rotate, and minus 90 will do the job. And then I want to shrink it a little bit so it fits on the page better. So again, you can transform and scale. And I'll just do like 70%, say. So it's on the page now. Now, again, I want to make um, that sulfur is kind of a light color of yellow. I don't think it will show up very good in a publication. And all the blacks are the, what I consider blacks are actually grays. So I want to change all of those too. So what you have to do now is a little sneaky, but you have to ungroup the molecule. If you've never used Adobe Illustrator, then I apologize. <laughs> but again, I'm going to select the whole thing and then go up to object and ungroup. Now I can individually do whatever I want to on this diagram. But one thing you can do is just select, say, a little portion like that, which is the gray thermal ellipsoid that I don't like, and say select same stroke color. And it actually is going to select everything that was gray when I wanted it black. <laughs> so I get everything at once that was gray. And then over here, I can check black, and it changes everything to black. Nice, huh? And as for the sulfur, I want to change that color, too. So I'm going to select that. I got both of them automatically. Now you can, uh, you can pick, a, say, an orangish color here, and then go to Color Guide, and it'll show you, and then click it here again. And it shows you a range of colors that are sort of the same. Like I might want to choose this one or this one. It'll be darker. Let's see what that one looks like. Yeah, that looks pretty good. I like that. Now, also, if I decided these labels were too small, I can pretty easily um, select them and expand them using the same kind of approach. But now I want to group it again. Don't forget to group it again, because now if I, move, if I try shifting it, I might pull it apart. So I want it all grouped. So I could do a select all and group. And lastly, I'm going to save it as a No, that's not what I want. Take it back. I want to export it. <laughs> export as TIFF and save. Uh, RGB is fine. That's what the journals recommend rather than CMYK because everything's online now. When they had print editions, they wanted CMYK. But online, they want RGB. So do RGB. And this, oh, this is the compression, LZW compression. It makes a big, big difference, and it doesn't affect anything that you do. Uh, it's fine to compress it. So I just say, OK, write the TIFF file, and now I can exit. Oh, one other thing you could do, which I recommended, was to make it um, single column width. Let me just show you how you would do that. So you can go to Window and, no, View, Show Grid. I have this scaled to inches, I apologize. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight and a half across, eight and a half inches across. So single column width would be three and a half inches. You can scale it however you want. So I want to shrink it so it fits in three and a half inches width and see how it looks. So I'm going to select all again and go to transform. Let me make a guess here, how big would that be? Maybe 
half the size it is now. You can just do control A too. So I'll scale by 50%, see how it looks. Um, is that three and a half? One, two, three, this is about 3.1, okay. You can also just drag it. So that'd be three and a half. And I don't know if this is showing it the way it would really show up printed. The, everything looks too fat here to me. Why that is may have something to do with some other thing that I haven't set correctly. So to be absolutely sure, if you have a printer available, you might want to print it and see how it looks printed. Huh. Sometimes this computer does strange things. Anyway. As long as you obey this DPI rule, it, everything will be fine. Now, sometimes you, wanna, you have a drawing and you want to crop it. You can also crop things in here, and you can crop things in Adobe Photoshop. And it also is compatible with this, these file types. So it's, it's a very useful program. OK, so there's, there's so many softwares out there now for doing graphics. I mean, there's, there's Diamond, there's Crystal Maker, there's all the other ones, Olex2, and so on. So you might just want to experiment around. And I, I gave you the website for Pavre. If you want to try that, just plan on spending the weekend learning it. <laughs> um, Platon, that program Platon, actually does put out a Pavre uh, drawing. And it gives you the file, and you can edit the file. You just have to know what you're doing when you edit the file. But it's a sort of a starting point. Um, how else? Oh, you can get also Pavre from Mercury. Yeah. So once you look at the file, you kind of see what's involved. You have to choose a lot of things. <laughs> OK, so let's end there. And I'll, I'll grab my husband's computer and see if I can run, install Peloton on his, and then we can go through some of the things that it does. Uh, other possible things we could talk about. Now, he's using it today, so I can't do that today. We could talk about phase transitions or um, something like that, or what else? Um, any ideas? <laughs> OK, I'll think about it. I mean, I think at this point, I've covered the main things for this course. It's gone pretty fast. So slow me down if I'm going too fast. OK. It's too complicated to use my husband's computer to install everything. So <laughs> I think we can make it work. It'll look better on your computer, though, because this, this laptop makes everything look tiny. Um, so there's three kind of main topics that I want to treat having to do with the use of Platon. The first is dealing with twins. And the second is dealing with the wrong space group. And the third is um, calculating what some of you will call void space or crystal packing indices or squeeze in some cases if you carry it to the next step. And then there's some other additional features that I'll point out along the way. Now again, this program was written a long time ago in some odd uh, coding that no one uses anymore, like I think it's C plus or something like that. And it looks old fashioned, but there's some good stuff in there, very good stuff. So I'm just going to use my computer because it's really hard to show this in a PowerPoint anyway. So let's look at a twin example, first of all. Now this was a structure that um, I thought it was solved. It looks beautiful. There's nothing big in the difference map. But the R value is 26%. So I let Platon help me to see if there was perhaps some twinning going on. And it's pretty remarkable what it can do. Let me show you. So this is the, uh, first of all, I'll show you what this, the target structure is. It's kind of neat. Also. Okay, um, 
So this is the asymmetric unit. And this is an orthorhombic space group, which is an unusual space group because it wasn't uh, described this way before. It has a new name. But anyway, it's orthorhombic C. Can you see that? That's the asymmetric unit. Guess what? It, it's a fullerene. <laughs> and then there's also uh, an acetonitrile in there, and that's all. So let me show you the uh, some of the packing, which is kind of cool, too. So fourth C70s surrounding an acetonitrile that's actually in, it's in an ordered position, which is pretty amazing. And um, I think it's just a ratio of one to one, actually, when you take into account symmetry and stuff. <clears throat> so over the years, I've collected a lot of solvates of fullerenes, and I still haven't written that paper. But occasionally, you know, these crystals are always just black crystals. You find one that's crystallized with dichloromethane or benzene, toluene, acetonitrile, uh, lots of solvates, lots and lots of solvates. And it's good, it's good to get those out there because other people will encounter them too and they'll never solve them. I, it took me a long time to figure this one out. So here's what we have. Let's shut this off. To begin with, I solved it with no twinning at all. And so here's the res file. Um, but again, the asymmetric unit isn't a whole C70, but it's, where is the nitrogen here? There should be a nitrogen. I hope I didn't chop it off. <clears throat> hmm. I think it's one of, it's maybe the C9 atom is the nitrogen. Anyway, you see that the R value is like 27%. So what you can do, have, having uh, done a refinement with ACTA command, which then generates a file called SIF, as you well know, it also uh, generates a file called FCF, which is a structure factor file. And Platon often requires this FCF file for its programs. So it, you need to have generated that in order to run some of the, some of the things that it has there. So I did that. I um, don't know what happened to that nitrogen, but it's not a huge deal. What I want to show you is the, the twinning thing. So here's Platon. And yeah, I think you can see this. It's this menu that is so tiny, and it shouldn't look that tiny, and it won't look that tiny on a Windows 7 machine. Uh, there's no way to fix it. I've tried changing the resolution and everything else, and it just doesn't work. Then I go to File, Select Data File. And go back to this. No twin. But I read in the SIF. And once that's read in, you have two choices. You can do the uh, command line kind of uh, interaction with the program, or you can use this graphical menu which really looks old-fashioned. <laughs> but every single item here does something different. And the one that's so powerful and which I, I really do like is this one called Twin Rote Mat. And unless it has the correct files, that won't be highlighted. It'll be dark. So it looks good. And I click on that. And pretty fast. It comes up with this. So the green boxes are suggested twins that are present at the same time, different twin laws. Um, notice the first one is, is some kind of simple um, just reorganization of the ABC parameters. It's a simple matrix. But the other ones are a little bit more intricate. The um, number of overlapping reflections is pretty high. Over a thousand reflections are overlapping with the ones that I already have that I'm using. So when you have a composite uh, twinning like this composite peaks, 
it's hard to figure out what's going on, but this program can do it. It's predicting a BASF 0.38, that means a fraction of the structure is this opposite orientation, 38%, and that by including this twin law, the R value will drop by 0.09. Then, that's not the only one, there's two more uh, that are a little bit less, but also there. So what you can do is select one or more of these ones in green. It's, it's, it's saying that the blue one is probably not so important, so I, I'm not going to pick that one. But the first one, um, to select it, <laughs> you would click on this one that says select TMAT1. It's a little hard to see, sorry. So it's, it's saying the twin matrix one. So I click on that. And then now it's going to output an HKLF5 file, which I explained to you before. It's like a batch file. It's different from HKLF4. So I go HKLF5 generate, click that. And now this is pretty hard to see, but it's, it's exactly like it was showing on that window. And let me minimize that. Go to the back to my directory here, and you see it's output these two new files: 1519 underline tw for twin, and hkl5. Let me just show you what that looks like. See, it's got this one at the end for the first batch, and then later on it'll have twos, I believe, or maybe not. Okay, because it's actually using the twin law to do it. But that is, a, that is an HKLF5 file. And then <coughs> it, in, it actually made a new INS file for me. So that's very nice. And the new INS file differs from the old INS file in that it has this BASF line. So you can, I assume you can just leave it like that or you can put in a starting number, which maybe is 0.35 or something like that. And then just refine that. Prompt. Okay, now I'm in that directory. Almost. Then I have to go to where I had written no twin. And I'm going to do XL on MN1519 underline TW. Again, this was only using the first twin matrix. So let's see how much effect it has. Remember, the R value was 26% before. Hmm. Interesting. No, maybe I did this wrong because it didn't drop. I thought it did. It would. Because the last time I did it, it dropped to 16%. Did I pick the wrong thing? Hmm. Maybe I didn't check it good enough because it should have changed. So let's try that again. Actually, it still has the file here, I believe, though you can't see it because it's, it's hard to see it. I think I can just go directly to this. So maybe because I can't see it this way, what it's saying very well, I didn't check it hard enough. Let's just check all three. TMAT1. Oh, I know what happened. I unchecked it. TMAT2, TMAT3 and HKLF5 generate. So I accidentally unchecked it because it was already selected. Sorry about that. <laughs> so I'm going to take care of all three of them now. And I should have closed that. That was stupid. So this is, this is the file I just read, wrote. 
So I'm going to do XL MN1519 underline TW underline. Ah, now you see the effect. You see that? R1 is 0 0.0648. It dropped a lot, 20%. So now I'm really happy with this structure, and it looks really nice. It doesn't look unusual at all. There's the uh, anisotropic thermal parameters. They all look normal. It says here, notice HKLF5, which it has to have if you have these batches. And nothing left in the difference map, so it's great, great structure. So score one for Platon, it saved me there. I can keep this structure, very happy about it. And also, if you look at this BASF line, it's changed now, so it, it's showing that there's a contribution from each of the three orientations. And that, those are all refined parameters. So the first one was the biggest one, but then there are other two minor ones that also count. So it actually goes from 0.26 to 0.16 to 0.06 in R1 values. Um, so sometimes it's worth just trying that. You know, you've finished your structure. The SIF doesn't have to be all edited. It just has to be written. So don't worry about putting in all those things that I yellowed the other day. Just try to just use it. Just put it in and try it. I mean, clearly I can update the weight and do a few more things here, but it's basically done. Okay, so that's one of the nice things that Platon will do. As I mentioned before, the other way to get an HKLF5 file is from the actual integration step, where you import two orientation matrices into the integration step. And then from there, you can output an HKLF5 file also. To get those two orientations, you run a program in the Brooker software called CellNow. I don't know if you've ever tried that. Uh, didn't bring the, anybody need to sell now to, to see what it looks like or is it worthless because you're not even there anyway? Yeah, okay, you let the technician do that. <laughs> In fact, um, I've had a little better luck with Platon than with sell now. They give the same result, but in terms of goodness of refinement, Platon seems to be a little better. Okay, so then the next thing I wanted to show you is Space group. And what if you have the wrong space group? So I made a structure with the wrong space group, but it doesn't really look that bad. So I solved it in PC. So PC is a subgroup of P21 over C. And often you can, you can solve structures in subgroups. So I just I forced it to solve in PC, because you can do that you know, with XT. You can force the space group. I got a solution, and it actually refines pretty well. So it's, it's this one. No, uh, I think I called it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the, OK, so it's non-centrosymmetric in PC. This is synchrotron data, you can tell because of the wavelength, 0.7749 extrins. Um, I didn't bother to make it anisotropic because I just want to make, prove the point here that I get this crazy BASF. Um, it doesn't, if it was truly the correct space group, it would be less than one. The BASF should not be greater than one. Also, um, The R value is actually 6%. So that doesn't raise a flag. That doesn't say, you better look at this again. But there's some strange things. Now, if you look at the LST file, let me get that one here. You can see some sort of strange behavior also. That's just because of the wavelength, the disp instruction. So I would normally put those in. But, um, so there's a lot of systematically absent reflections that shouldn't be uh, 
uh, wrong here. The, uh, let's see, it's going down. So that first F obs is so bad, I don't remember if that goes away or not. The distances don't look too horrible, and the structure looks approximately right, although I do know there is a hydrogen in the structure that doesn't show up. The difference map doesn't show that hydrogen. This is the structure I showed you before. It's, uh, it's this one. It looks like this. So just looking at that, it doesn't look too terrible. It doesn't even look that distorted. Um, but like I said, the, there's the hydrogen on one of these, on, each, on two of the oxygens that isn't showing up. So let me show you what happens if you put this into Platon. I'm just going to read the SIF, but I could also read the res in this case. And again, I'll go to this crazy menu. And it'll actually give error messages if I do a lot of things here, like if I do the validation, or if I go calc all over here, it'll say something. What if I just say add sim shellx? The, the reason to do add sim shellx is if it does detect a higher symmetry, it'll output a new file for you, um, cutting off the spurious atoms if necessary. So the asymmetric unit should be less if you go to higher symmetry, right? Okay, so here's add sim. And I know you can't read that, that's teeny tiny. But it's actually in another file, it's in this one. This one. I think you can read this one. So it starts out looking for higher symmetry, and if it finds it, it transforms it to the higher symmetry. So it found 26 atoms. Um, you see it says this is the input cell, this is a reduced cell. It goes through that step of making a reduced cell, and then it goes back to the conventional cell that says it's monoclinic with Lowry symmetry 2 over M. Well, PC doesn't have Lowry symmetry 2 over M. It has Lowry symmetry of M. So here it says space group P21 over C, so on and so forth. Origin is shifted after transformation. It has to shift the origin because one of the atoms is on a special position. There's a lot of extra printing here. <laughs> uh, connected input set is assumed to be true. Well, it was true. And then it ends, and then it outputs. But you see this list here. These are atoms that are un unnecessary because the asymmetric unit is only half the size of the first one. So it's deleting all these atoms and then creating a new file. And the new file is it starts out like this. It says PC, and then it says new P21 over C. So that lets you know for sure that it has changed it, and it puts in the new symmetry operations for you, and does all that work. And then it puts out a new file that's going to be like underline PL something, 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 um, or underline SX. In general, it puts out a lot of things that you don't really want. And if you want, you can also tidy Platon files, then it won't put out the unnecessary ones like 
There's some there with zero size. You know, go away. Okay. So I am assuming that it's the underline SX that I want because that's the one with the ins file. So if I take that. I guess just refine it. Mm, no, that's not right. It's, that's not the right file. See, that's still PC, so that's not the one that I want. Hold on. <laughs> Um, I guess it's PL. Yeah, that's P21 over C. You can see lat is one, so that's a center symmetric one. So it has to be married to some uh, HKL file. This was also synchrotron data. You see the disks are in this one. But it's it's much smaller unit cell. I mean, uh, number of atoms. And then down at the bottom, it gives the transformation matrix that it used to convert it, which is sometimes useful. Okay. Then let's see what does this refine with. So save as. Let's just call it mn two three one four dot ins. I think I have to use my old HKL. I don't see any other HKLs. So now it looks more like it's going to converge because these maximum shifts are much smaller. And I assume that the uh, water, oxygen, uh, hydrogen will show up. So I can continue this refinement. I mean, the, the main point is that, I mean, I know what the correct structure is. I know what it should look like. Um, even though the R value didn't change that much, it's correct. It's more correct in the higher symmetry because the number of, of parameters is less. And definitely the SIF checker will give you an error message if you don't do this. It will also claim that there's a higher symmetry space group. Let's, let's open that file again. Let's see. So, yeah, I overwrote the SIF. Didn't mean to, but I did. <laughs> so let's open that SIF. menu again. Um, just, you know, taking a structure that you've completed, you can do lots of things with it. You can calculate the crystal packing index, that's KPI. You can also do calc solve. So both of those would tell you whether or not there's a solvent accessible void. And if there is, then <clears throat> in some cases you want, want to run squeeze. So what happens if I click on calc solve? Mm, no residual solvent accessible void. Okay. How about KPI? KPI is kind of nice. Do you know how much void space there is in a typical structure? At, at, room, at uh, standard atmospheric pressure? This is pretty remarkable, actually. So in this case, it's about 76% filled and 24% void space. If you subject a crystal to high pressure, like you can do at a beam line, for example, with a diamond anvil cell, just go up to maybe 10 gigapascals, which isn't that high a pressure, you, you diminish the amount of void space remarkably. 
it actually is very compressible. You do it too much and you crush the crystal, but it can go quite a ways before it crushes. So you can squeeze out that void space. Pretty amazing. So that's a very typical value for the KPI. The, in other words, the packing index. Uh, the K stands for some Russian's name, whose name I forget, but he was the one who invented this idea. So I'm not going to do squeeze. There's no point. There's no space, right? Um, you can validate the SIF, except this one isn't ready to be validated because it's blue, and I overwrote it. You can do um, calc all. So let's see if I have one that would read better. Hold on a sec. Well, let's just look at this one, which was the, um, the one that was wrong. What happens if I do that? So again, you can't read this, but it, it outputs a listing file that you will be able to read. This is way more information than you ever want from a structure. <laughs> Everything you could ever want to know. Um, yes, yeah, so he first wrote these programs in about 1980. He gives um, the ortho orthogonalization matrix, so that would convert to Cartesian coordinates if you needed that. It gives the symmetry operations for the space group. It gives you the the Schoenflies uh, point symmetry, checks for additional symmetry, and yeah, it was wrong. So here they're saying new or pseudo symmetry is p to 1 over c. So that also figures that out. It gives you uh, the transformation matrix to transform it. Coordinates of unique residues. Well, in this case, there aren't any residues, so that's not so interesting. Um, <laughs> if you have a lot of planar uh, groups in your structure, it'll give you the least squares planes automatically. Sometimes it gives you dihedral angles. It's pages and pages of output, usually you know, 20, 30, 40 pages. Um, but there are some interesting things here. The, uh, I think the crystal packing index is in here too. It calculates the bond lengths and then compares them to known bond lengths and gives you this very nice chart where your distances are the ones here on average and these are sort of the distribution of known values. And you, so you can see that the values that you're obtaining are kind of in the midpoint of known values, or average values for bond lengths. So that's kind of useful. Um, it tells you, in fact, if they're formal single bonds or formal double bonds. Um, here's some least squares planes. Yeah, on and on and on. Really amazing. <laughs> if oh, it also will get give you absolute structures or an absolute configuration. So it does that analysis and tells you whether it's R or S. And I think I've never seen that it's done it wrong, so I think it's doing it right. Puckering analysis, some people look at that. Um, this was a 10 membered ring, so it computes various things for the 10 membered ring, et cetera. I mean, it, you, you can see that it's way more than you could ever want, but there's a lot of information there. I'm only halfway through. more than you could want. <laughs> okay, so the latest reference for uh, Platon is this one here in 2015. It actually is mostly about squeeze, but it also is the latest reference that you should quote if you do quote Platon. And it is updated all the time. Several times a year it's updated. There's a GUI, and that is called PWT, and it 
isn't updated as often. You can use Playtime on Spec's website, or you can use it uh, on a Windows computer using the programs that are put out by Louis Ferrugia. So if you want the Windows version, just Google uh, Playtime Windows, and you'll go to Louis Ferrugia's website, and you can download them there. And it's just two files to download. And he's simplified the installation this year, so it's really quite easy to install it. It used to be you had to modify all these environment variables and everything, but you don't have to do that anymore. So, um, yeah, it's handy to have. Let's see, is there anything else about Playtown I want to show you? Yeah, okay. If you want to look at the systematic absences, you can get listings of those. There's a lot here. Um, the flip thing was a method of solving structures that was uh, popular for a while, but has been really supplanted by XT. But it was fun to watch because it showed you the progress in the structure as it was being solved. Do you, do you know about this term, bond valence? Um, now I'm not remembering the guy's name, but it's a way of determining the oxidation state of a metal. It's a, some equations that he, he uses. And if it's unclear what the oxidation state should be, particularly in things like copper, some that where it's more or less ambiguous, the bond valence calculation usually gives you the right oxidation state. Um, so the flip things will help solve the structure. It's, you can try it. Try it. Um, these are sort of subsets of calc-all. So if you just wanted some of these. The, um, one of these, I think maybe the calc coordination gives you the tau values that you need to distinguish between square pyramid and trigonal bipyramid, that kind of thing. Um, there's miscellaneous tools that are useful too. Like somebody gives you a SIF, but you'd like to see it in a res. You can just input that SIF and say create res, and it makes it into a res. Or you want to make a PDB file, you can do that. Somebody gives you an FCF, and you want it to be an HKL. You can do that right here. Um, let's see. Yeah, it's this one, FCF to HKL. Makes an HKL out of an FCF. In the old uh, active journals, they, they did archive FCF files in some cases, but not HKL. So that's one reason why you want that. Now, the validation is exactly the same as the one that you get on the IUCR website. So sometimes, it, like if you don't have an internet connection, you can run your validation right on your home computer. You don't have to send it to the website. And it's pretty fast to do it here. And in both cases, if there's alerts, it outputs as a VRF, this a VRF file that you can use to create your response, then put the response at the end of the SIF. So you don't have to figure out the crazy syntax for that, which is handy, very handy. Mm, let's see what else. The graphics. I'm not that excited about the graphics, but you can do graphics. Um, sometimes you'll see a SIF checker where there are graphics, and those are generated by this program. Uh, Bifoot pair. Bifoot pair, that's the way we really um, actually determine the absolute configuration what's called bifoot pair. And so you're taking uh, pairs of reflections which should be different by anomalous dispersion and finding them and seeing if they are different. Um, and so it's some kind of uh, subtraction divided by standard deviation. And so I'll give you a listing of the important ones. Um, I used to do it that way, in fact. I would get a listing of the bifoot pairs and look at the ones that had the biggest difference and then actually go back and find them again. And this was on a point detector. On a point detector, you go to a specific HKL. It's not like an area detector. So you go to a specific HKL and remeasure it. So we used to determine absolute configuration that way. All right, so, yeah. Oh, structure tidy is cool, too. It, uh, so it, if you haven't brought all of your structure together into one unique molecule, it'll do that for you. And there's also some other things that you can run from the command prompt 
that will calculate anomalous dispersion for different wavelengths and, and actually uh, bring all of your molecules into the center of the unit cell also. So if you're interested in that, that also is a possibility. I guess, well, those are the main things that I would say Platon would be used for nowadays. Some of these have been ob become obsolete, but they're there. And this was a big service to the community to have this. This was the beginning of CIFCHEC. That was really a huge contribution. So any questions about that, about Platon? You see, I'm not running it from within a program. I'm just running it as a program by itself and having the files that I need to input. So you don't need to run it from within WinGX or something like that. Just download it, install it. It's just two files, two small files, and then you put it on your desktop and you have it all the time. It's really useful. Have any of you ever tried this for doing a twin? Slick, huh? Yeah. And if you're having a problem reducing the R value, you don't know why it isn't going down, you could try it. There's no harm in trying. You just need the SIF and the FCF. And the SIF doesn't have to be edited. Okay. Okay. I think that's all I brought today. So uh, I think tomorrow is our last two lectures, so you've got to tell me what you want to hear. Mm -hmm. You're right. You need the majority of the atoms for it to work. Yeah. If there are too many that don't make sense, then it will crash and it will complain. You're right. Mm -hmm. So try to get approximate positions at least for your atoms before you run it. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So you have tried it. That's good. <laughs> Okay. Uh, sometimes it also crashes if it doesn't like your numbering scheme. If you're using non-standard numbers, which are like some of the ones you might get out of uh, Olex 2 or something. Uh, it'll tell you. It'll tell you. I mm, hope that's helpful. Anything else? So since tomorrow's our last day, um, the one thing I want to tell you about is this, are some synchrotron things. But what else would you like to hear about? <laughs> Requests? Solve more structures? Um, would you like to hear about phase transitions? Anything like that? Um, I mean, we really have covered a lot, I think, in these lectures. And I'm not used to using PowerPoint. I'm used to scribbling on the blackboard. PowerPoint makes you, unfortunately, go a little fast. So I covered a lot. <laughs> OK, so all right. And tomorrow night, party. <laughs> <laughs>